Okay. That's the camera, yeah. Awesome. So this is titled Biogeography and Plant Life of Middle Earth. Um, so we're going to jump right in. So there's a few texts that I want to highlight. Um, I was chatting with Ray the other week, like one of the first weeks of the semester, and he handed me this book, Flora of Middle Earth. And if you look at the authors, Walter Judd and Graham Judd, it's a father's son. And I was like, Judd, like, I really recognize that name. And then on the left, Plant Systematics, a Phylogenetic Approach. This was my undergraduate textbook for, uh, I did botany previously, and Judd is the very first author on it. And I was like, no way. So it's uh, Walter, yeah, Walter Judd is the author of that. So uh, Walter Judd is a really famous uh, University of Florida phylogeneticist or plant taxonomist. And he also has an interesting path with uh, the fictitious world as well. And then there's another book. This is the other book I found that was published, uh, Plants of the Middle Earth. I didn't use the one on the right. I mainly used primary text. So I used The Hobbit mostly. Um, I didn't dive into The Lord of the Rings. Um, I'm reading it currently again, but I just wanted to focus solely on The Hobbit because there's a lot of material there that we can kind of go through um, in regarding to the flora and biogeography of Middle Earth. So first I wanna just talk about as an aside as, my, uh, as a researcher and how I see the world. Uh, and that is first, intense focus on education through plant life. I see plants also as actors in learning. So I see them just as much uh, able and there and present with us in our world, just as humans. So using them as our teachers. Um, and then another thing is I'm really fascinated with recently is seeing tree rings on the right. We were in Yellowstone, we were coring some trees in Yellowstone and I see tree rings as a narrative. So similar to how we view fictitious worlds that humans write, I'm trying to delve into how we see tree rings as narratives and trees as the storytellers of our past climates and past worlds. Great, that is kind of just a primer for this entire talk. So first thing though, is I wanna have you all group up. So hopefully you found some type of group, four-ish roughly. I want you to work in that group for just a couple minutes. I want you to start jotting down a definition of biogeography, what you think it means. Uh, and then also I want you to list as many plants as possible that are in the Hobbit um, as you can. So feel free to group up and start running. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, try to, from your mind, just try to think, oh, this was mentioned in the Hobbit. This was mentioned in the Hobbit. This was mentioned in the Hobbit. So yeah, it gets work. Yeah. It'll be like three minutes, okay? <laughs> We're doing an activity right now. So just feel free to work with people around. Get over here. Get the group. All right. Let's get a bit of a sun guy. I'm sorry. Let's get a bit of a sun guy. Yeah, yeah. So you have a very complex yeah <laughs> 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 there's usually a key species yeah. that is plotted out of right exactly or even features of the world so, yeah. and that's actually oh, one thing yeah. i guess yeah, I 
large part of me. I mean, shy. Everything over the room is basically on the couch. Well, the two features that you mentioned, which are essentially a sire with the street and then the famous, which is a V shaped salad showing up. So we're all just like okay, okay, we're gonna change back in really quick. So just we're gonna start with the second question first. Can people just like we're gonna call it a share and I'm gonna write it up here? Everything's can okay. people I'm gonna twist this as well? Can people just start saying some of the plants that they're like, this is in the hobbit? Uh, wait, 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 okay. What I, what? I, what? I, is that what it's tobacco. Oh, tobacco, tobacco, yeah. sorry. Tobacco yeah. Nice. Eight. Others? Sorry. Fine. Very good. Oh, very good. Nice. Not directly, indirectly, though. Nice. Mushrooms. Not a plant. <laughs> I'll come back to that. We'll, we'll come back to that. Sorry, that was very broad. <laughs> Not a uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. We'll group berries as well. We'll talk about that as well. Oak. Oak, yep. Uh, tea leaves? Because they did Yeah, very good, very good. Uh, I heard an apple. Yeah, yeah, just start, you check it out. Oh, birch and acelos. Birch, and what'd you say? Acelos, king soil. That. What'd you say? King soil. King soil. King King's King's oil. King's it's what Aragorn used. So not oil. in the Hobbit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, what? Yeah, yeah. and oh, also birch. Oh, birch is also not in the Hobbit, but it's still tree. Betula, the genus Betula. Very good. Yeah. Okay, this doesn't count, but I feel like it deserves mention. Is um like the tree monster humans? It's the it's, yeah, yeah. So not in the Hobbit. However, to the cosmology of the world, intensely important in the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. I'm not going to be talking much about the Ents in this talk, but when I talk about the dendrochronology of Middle Earth, I'll definitely be talking about Ents because they move and trees in our world don't move. And that has huge implications when we're trying to reconstruct climate <laughs> in terms of... <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that's a really interesting, when we apply dendrochronology lens to Middle Earth, we could have some trouble, um, but yeah. I don't remember if it says specifically what kind of grass, but there's definitely grass. Very good. Like so grass is a tricky word in the botanical world because we actually have three distinct phylogenetic groups. I'm going to use that word and we'll talk about it. We have grasses, we have sedges, and then we have rushes. He actually does separate these beautifully, actually. Um, and he uses the names differently on how humans actually use them. So I preface with all... Oh, by geography, anybody is like, I know what this is. Yep. What's your definition of it? Uh, well, just geography biology Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we'll jump to that. That's exact. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Great. Um, I'm going to jump in. We're going to jump back. So I said the flora of Middle Earth, right? So a flora or floristics inventory is a collection of all species of plants within a given area. So I would like to think my reading, my first reading of The Hobbit, was doing a flora of the book. I underlined throughout the entire text every single plant that was ever mentioned in it, diving into also not just the plants, but also traces of plants, right? So somebody said wheat, he never says wheat, but he says cakes, he says breads, he says beer. So you can inform what is beer made out of traditionally in England, where the Tolkien would have been during the early 1900s. Yeah. Yeah, barley. Yeah, yeah. Barley is another plant we can chuck in there. So we can inform uh, pickles is mentioned. So we know there are cucumbers in Middle Earth. Um, and in the first page, he mentions a garden. So there's a good chance that Bilbo grew cucumbers in a garden. So we can actually reconstruct also what Bilbo's garden might have looked like as well in terms of it. But I'll be diving into all the plants mentioned in The Hobbit, so we might have to pick up the pace up just slightly. But that is a flora or a fleur six inventory. I put all because 
in practice, it's really difficult to know what all plants are in a given area because you do it over a few years and new plants could either disappear or be introduced into that area within your given study. But it is a very scientific approach to a botanical research question. Great, phylogenetic tree, we talked about phylogenies. Does anybody know what this is? Does anybody know what this specific image is of? So it's the very first ever phylogenetic tree drawn. Um, it was by Darwin in his sketchbook when he was on the HMS Beagle going around the world. He drew this in his sketchbook and it has now been kind of ingrained within phylogenetic studies. But a phylogeny is just a tree of relationality over long periods of time. Or this is millions and millions of years, right? So you can think about it like I'm related to my mother and my father. They have parents, we can branch out, but this is over deep time. I'm gonna use that word, not as deep as Dr. Baker's talk with rocks and geology of Middle Earth, but still pretty deep time. We're talking about millions and million, millions of years. So this is kind of the accepted phylogenetic tree of living plants on earth. I don't know where ints would probably fall in this. They're probably within this clade, which means a grouping. Um, so we can say some of the most like story or basal or not as evolved groups of plants are the bryophytes, the lichens, the mosses, the liverworts. Then we get into more of the manilophytes and the lycophytes, or termed the pteridophytes. These are our ferns, which are mentioned in um, The Hobbit. Uh, mosses are, ferns are. We have gymnosperms, ferns. They're very important in The Hobbit in terms of the pines somebody mentioned, but we also have furs. Um, and then the angiosperms. That's kind of whenever you think of a plant that's not a grass or a grain, you're thinking of an angiosperm, um, with a few exceptions, of course. But that's the phylogenetic tree, just to introduce that concept to you all. And then biogeography, our definitions. We're going to use the Oxford de definition to reference Tolkien's roots. So it's the branch of biology that deals with the geographical distribution of plants and animals. That's very biology heavy. I like the second one better, Britannica, is the study of the geographic distribution of plants, animals, and other forms of life. I think that one I like a bit more because it situates us more within a geographical lens rather than a biological lens. Here's the history of biogeography. Does anybody know the name of the person on the far left? It's not Darwin, it's uh, one of his colleagues. What'd you say? Marx? No, not Marx. <laughs> Probably had some ideologies maybe, yep. Is that Linnaeus? No, I do have a picture of Linnaeus okay. soon, but this is Wallace, Alfred Wallace. He's seen as the father of uh, biogeography. So he and Darwin kind of battled to start the theory of evolution. Darwin is usually given that title, however, uh, Wallace is really the person that was like, okay, you got your evolution, I'll take biogeography. And then in 1967, we have two really big heavy hitters that pushed the, the realm of biogeography, really like it exploded the field. And this was this book right here, The Theory of Island Biogeography. This is uh, MacArthur up here who died when he was in his 40s, um, sadly. And then E.O. Wilson, who recently just passed away. Um, he has seen, both of them are seen as the the fathers of modern biogeography. What they did was they went to these island chains, they gassed these like really small islands, killing all forms of life, and then looked at the new colonizations based off the size of the islands. And they found that the bigger islands were able to hold more species basically. And they did a lot more mathematics behind that when I'm just summing it up quickly, but they really exploded the field to what we now know is just an ever expansive field of biogeography. So this is the textbook I used in undergrad when I was reading about biogeography. But now we've delved into a lot more weird areas, right? So we have like queer ecologies, which is a form of biogeography of how queer humans and animal and life forms equate and re have relationality to the earth um, through space. We have fictitious fiction books, right? Uh, as well, looking at the biogeography. So we have narrative in the Anthropocene, one of our teachers over there. We also have fiction books that are delving more into the futures of uh, animal and plant distributions. Counter mapping I put up here. This is a specific lens of biogeography where you look at the power relations over space and time. And then landscape genomics is where people are doing really small scale projects of genetic studies in streams or very small studies to see the different micro evolution going on. So this field has really explored a massive terrain. Yeah. So isn't there also landscape genetics, which actually looks at flood gene flow through complex landscapes and it looks at the impact of geography yeah. on gene flow? That makes me think of like eDNA, if anybody's heard of this. What people do is they go into streams, they can dip this little test tube, collect the water, run it through 
a sequencer and then they can kind of reconstruct what animals are in the streams just based off of the water um, because they're shedding their DNA because it's a chemical in the water. Yeah, so we're going to keep on trucking. Biogeography, these are the realms of investigation. Traditionally, we have biodiversity patterns, uh, communities, novelties, kind of the more nuanced uh, ways of investigating biogeography. So we have natural selection, interbreeding, polyploidy, which is genome doubling, which is very important in plant life. Humans can't double our genome um, and live. We can. Uh, it's very difficult for humans to change up our chromosomal uh, makeup, but plants can very readily and they do. And it's a very interesting tactic that they do, um, especially in ferns. So that's why I bring it up. Uh, patterns of the past. So we can look at fossils and reconstruct maybe some of our tectonic movements of plants that used to live in certain areas. And then we have patterns of today, so phylogeography, so mapping those phylogenetic trees over space. Great. And then, of course, I have to put up the map of Middle Earth to situate our biogeographical lens, right? We're moving from west to east. Uh, Dr. Baker, she kind of did hint at one of the things I wanted to talk about today. So we're just going to start delving into it. So what I did was um, I took every single quote of a plant into The Hobbit and folded the plants up on here. So we're going to kind of go through it pretty quick. So you all can start getting a whole lens of how important plants are to Middle Earth and to Tolkien. Very first page, gardens and meadows are mentioned, right? So we're kind of maybe thinking of a lush field in England that he's looking out on where he's in his like cottage, writing about the Hobbit, maybe himself as being a Hobbit. I don't know if we can make that jump. We maybe can. Is he saying he's a Hobbit in some regards because he is talking very fondly about gardening. Um, somebody said tobacco. Very good. That was page four. This is the, technically the first species ever mentioned in The Hobbit or in the Middle Earth is tobacco, which is kind of fun to think about. We can go on. We're on page five now. Great lily, snapdragons, and laburnums of fire. Um, I put the laburnums up here because we can do some investigating. We can dig deeper. So this is la uh, laburnums uh, are in the pea family. So we have the pea family represented. So we know nitrogen fixation is happening in Middle Earth. Um, we can make that jump pretty easily. Yeah. Um, do you know if these slides will be up on the canvas? So yeah, I can yes. make it available. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They'll all be up there. Yeah, yeah. Feel free to uh, go through all of this later and read the quotes. Um, so yeah, we know nitrogen fixation is going on in Middle Earth, which is fun. So we know there's microbial life by page five. Um, because we ch should think going in, we're only going to trust what the text says. We can't think, oh, because Dr. Dazani has said multiple times that Middle Earth is Earth, but we can erase that idea and start building our own idea of what Middle Earth is. Great. We now see that we get some emotions. Baggins is very fond of flowers. We can see that the Bilbo has a very uh, a liking towards the flowers. So we can see that in his lens going forward, that he's going to maybe mention more about the plant life, which he readily does. So we have, we can also now go to the climbing of trees. So we can see that people have a relationality to plant life in Middle Earth. They're starting, they are fond of the activities they can do with plants, such as climbing them. Somebody mentioned tea, really good. Um, we have cakes, a little beer. So that we're at the party where all the um, not elves, dwarves come in and they're crashing Bilbo's place, right? So we have a bunch of cakes. So we have flour, we have eggs. So that means we have chickens, not a plant, but still they're probably eating something, um, some type of grain as well. Beer, so we have barley, we have wheat, um, maybe rye. Uh, we have seed cakes. That could mean a myriad of things. We don't really know. We can maybe guess off of British um, recipes, maybe. Um, we have porter, so we have coffee. Um, so I put that up there. We have coffee as well. Okay, we're going to keep on going. We have red wine, so we have grapes. We have raspberries, very good. Apples, mince pies, uh, pork, salad. Salad is very generic, so we probably have lettuce. Um, we have pickles, so we have cucumbers. Uh, the pines were roaring on the height, and then he loved maps. I, I underlined the crap out of that because I was like, by geography, like we're here, like we can jump in now. We we also see that Bilbo maybe would be a biogeographer in another life, maybe. Great. Um, willows. So this is something. So wind got up and willows along the banks. So we can also see that Tolkien is a very observant person in terms of riparian buffer zones. So these are the regions between an aquatic ecosystem and more of a terrestrial one where water is inundated into the soil and very specific plants have to live or can live in this area. So if you think along Paradise Creek, if you ever walked along it, 
Um, willows are readily along that area because they can be inundated with water in their roots, which a lot of things can't do. Like imagine us, if we had to stand in water for like a year, like our feet would disintegrate and it'd be pretty tragic probably, I would imagine. Um, and also we can maybe make a jump. They don't say this in the Hobbit at least, but willow is where we get aspirin. So we know that aspirin is in this world. We know pain medicine is in this world. If they use it or not, we don't know, but we can at least make that jump. Um, this, I wanted to put this picture in because it made this quote made me think of when I was in the Peaks District in England. So heather is an ericaceous species, so that means it's in the blueberry family, um, but it grows on these rocky hillsides and countrysides of England uh, where you have just this heather, a rock, some moss. Um, so when I read this quote, I was like, oh, this is totally like English countryside, the Peaks District. So we're in like north-ish West England at this point. Um, possibly. This is something that I found deeply fascinating. So I'm going to read it. Or does anybody want to read it? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, go for it, please. Uh, the air grew warmer as they got lower, and the smell of the pine trees made him drowsy, so that every now and again he nodded and nearly fell off, or bumped his nose on the pony's neck. Their spirits rose and they went down and down. Trees changed to beech and oak, and there was a comfortable feeling in the twilight. The last green had almost faded out of the grass when they came um, at length to an open glade not far up at the banks of the stream. Boom! Elevational gradients right there. <laughs> so we're talking about he's in high elevation. This is a Sonoran desert, but it, it shows the picture really well. So we have pine or fir gymnosperm dominated forest. He's going down. We get in more beech oak dominated forest. So maybe like central European forest type, if you're thinking about that. And then we get down and down and we go to a stream where there's a glade. A glade is basically this uh, habitat where it's dominated. It's really rocky. So very few plants can live there in terms of uh, they're massive. So it's usually dominated by really small herbaceous plants or mosses, very few trees, maybe on the exterior of a glade. Um, but that isn't a key to biogeography is as you go higher in elevation, the air pressure decreases, there's less oxygen, so less plants can live up there. So that's why we usually have gymnosperms. It's also colder, which gymnosperms are better at tolerating because of the snow um, or evolve to carry more snow or let snow slide off of their branches compared to oaks, which are lovers of the sun. So they have all their leaves pointed straight up to the sun, but that doesn't help with the snow as much. Um, so yeah, we have elevational gradients right there in that one quote. I read that and I was like, shh, shh. like this is perfect for explaining a key to biogeography uh, plant distributions. Another one is hay making. So we have hay, we have blackberries as well. Um, a common misconception, this is a bit of an aside, but raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, uh, the term berry is not evolutionarily uh, conserved, meaning in that phylogenetic tree, it's not like we have the group of the berries. So if you ever are like eating a fruit salad or something, don't think that all of these are in the same group of uh, relations or plants. Um, they're actually pretty dispersed in their evolved uh, habitats or behaviors, I guess. And then another one, so this is when Bilbo is in the cave with, um, oh God, his name escapes me right now. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we have the ring and they're doing the battle of the pros or whatever you wanna call it. So we have 30 white horses on a red hill. First they champ then they stamp, then they stand still. Chestnuts, chestnuts, he hissed. And I was like, oh, chestnuts, that's on my arm. I love chestnuts. <laughs> my entire master's dissertation was on chestnuts. <laughs> so I specifically looked at the American chestnut, which went extinct because of uh, globalization. It's still in the Eastern parts of the forest very dispersely, but I was like, oh, chestnuts. And we have a chestnut tree on campus during the, uh, uh, what year we, September, October, we had a chestnut party, our lab, because we collected a bunch of chestnuts. So I love the chestnuts. So we can think of them eating chestnuts as they're going through the forest. Um, they have the chestnuts still in Europe, so I'm very jealous, but we still have chestnut hanging on the American chestnut. And so I was like, oh, great. And it's in a prose battle. Like, how cool, you know? <laughs> so we can also just relate that back is when they're doing this prose battle, it's a, like a, a, a tease of words and a Actually, they're riddles. Riddles, yeah. Thank you. Riddles, yeah. not prose. And, but... and, and that's that's we find that in a lot of mythologies of Europe. Yeah, thank you. But we can then infer into that is clearly plants are ingrained in their histories and their oral histories and their folklore of Middle Earth, which is fascinating to kind of dissect. This is a picture of a glade that we kind of look. So we have bracken, that's a fern. Um, we have pine again. Um, 
top of the, so this is when they are climbing the trees to escape the goblins and then they oversee the wolves, right? Um, so it's interesting, he chose this, uh, three different gymnosperms. He's saying one person climbed a larch, which is a in the genus Larix. We have a pine, which is in the genus Pinus. And then we have a fir, which is in the uh, genus Abies. Or is that spruce? Abies. Ooh, sorry. I can't remember. It's either Abies or a different genus. My apologies. But then they were overlooking at a glade habitat where the wolves came to um, kind of, what was it? A ceremony, right? A, a, a ceremony of fire with the king wolf in the center. Keep moving on. So we have, it was high summer and on this Eastern side of the mountains, rain shadow effect. My gosh, perfect. Here we go. She was saying that the weather goes from West to East. Boom, she was right on the money with this quote right here. So we're seeing that on the Eastern side of the mountains that there's less water. And that is because, let me grab this, right? So we can think about the Rockies. Um, if we have the US, we have Western coast of California, Rockies. We have a lot of very water rich, air traveling, being dumped, it goes up in elevation. And as you go in up in elevation, we can't hold as much water into it. So it's dumping in form of snow on the Rockies. And when it goes over that mountain, it is almost lost all of its water. So it's a lot of dry water that's being dumped on these deserts. And that's what's happening in Middle Earth as well. As you go on the Eastern side of the mountains, we have yellowing bracken, falling branches, deep piled of pine needles, uh, dead trees, which is super interesting. Just, you also get compressional warming. Uh, as the air comes down, yeah. to get compressional warming as well. So yeah, yeah, that that quote, and like, that takes air, that takes moisture out of the air, so mm -hmm. it makes it even more dry. Yeah. yeah. So that's a picture of yellow and bracken up there. We have another one. Uh, you, you is a gymnosperm. <laughs> it's in the genus Taxus. Um, this is probably Taxus picata. So we can see that they make bows out of the yew branches. Uh, we can see that we have oaks, elms, and wide grasslands. Does anybody know what this is right here? This little pest. So this is Dutch elm disease, which is super interesting to think about because this was published in 35, 1935, correct? Yes. Yeah. And in 1927 is when Dutch elm disease came into the UK. So it was just starting to wreak havoc when he was writing The Habit, Hobbit and when it was published, which is interesting to think about the timeline of Tolkien as a person and as an author writing about a tree species that is soon to be almost eliminated from the countryside of England. Great, oh, clover, my gosh, another one on the arm, right? So um, we get, I, I mentioned this, so we have acorns and he says, if any had been right enough yet, we get a mention of seasonality in uh, Middle Earth now, we have seasons in Middle Earth. We also have phenology, does anyone know what that word means? So it's the study of cycles of plants and animals. So flowering time is the study of phenology of a plant. Um, and then this is one of my favorite quotes, not because I have a, a liking towards clover, but this is the, one of the only times he mentions very specific species of one genus. So genus trifolium is the genus of clovers. He says wavy patches of coxcomb clover, purple clover, and wide stretches of short, white, sweet, honey smelling clover. This is what we have in America. We also have that one. These are both non native in the US, but they are native to Europe. And we also have this one as well, which is the coxcomb clover. So I have to plug another thing. I love clovers. Um, I'll talk about them a bit later, but we get niche partitioning here, which is a concept in biogeography where species and a certain group have evolved certain ways to capitalize or to really uh, dig deep into one type of resource. So we can think about birds because it's very visual. Um, we have the flamingos, they have long necks and long legs so they can get deeper into the water while maybe an oyster catcher wouldn't be able to do that but it has a very long bill to get oysters that the flamingo might not be able to eat. So that's why we have different species and a huge wide array of species within a given ecosystem because they can share in these niches that are very distinct and separate. So a niche is, I guess I should have said that first, a niche is a very specific area that a species occupies. It can change over time. It definitely changes over space. Um, and that's where they evolve to get different behaviors and life forms. We can think about that in terms of the clover, which he's kind of introducing here. So we can look at a study that I was able to do during my master or during my undergraduate, where we made a phylogenetic tree of trifolium. And he mentions two species in our study. So we had the white clover and the red clover right there that I was able to encode in the genetic. Um, we were able to 
sequenced the genome of the clover, um, and we made a phylogenetic tree, and we can see that there's very specific niche partitioning within our groups of clovers. These are all very related. They all are biennials, meaning they flower every other year. They also really like um, rocky habitats, but what made Reflexum and Beharyensis different from Kentuckiensis or the Kentucky clover was Kentucky clover was able to exploit or capitalize or really live in love with acidic soils, which these other two don't really do as much. And that's potential why we can think of it evolve uh, in that habitat distinctly and genetically and morphologically, meaning its physical characteristics different from the other two species. Yeah. So if some of these, like the specific uh, genuses that he's mentioning are um, like, work better in certain types of soil than other types of soil, does that mean that we're also kind of getting, I guess, a view not only of the plant life, but also of the soil that it's been? Yeah. Absolutely. You're getting to a really great point. Often whenever I'm doing myself looking into the, the plant life of an area, I'll look at the geology map. Uh, Dr. Baker was talking about this. Really, plants reflect to some degree the geology of a region, um, especially the acid. If it's acidic or basic soil, that's something that they really reflect. But the soil types is super crucial for the plants. You can think about us, right? I can't live in a desert because uh, I would die. I don't know how to live in a desert ecosystem, but I know how to live in a temperate uh, mixed mesophytic forest of Southeast United States, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, it definitely, all plant life will reflect the geology underlying it. Another quote, so we have ancient oaks. That is a really, really important cosmology in the UK with humans. Um, when I was there, I talked to a lot of people who would use the term ancient oak. Um, there's even nonprofits titled like ancient oaks or they, I can't remember the term, but there are groups of people who've gone into these ecosystems in England, and they try to find the oldest oak species ever in that country living right now. So it's very like... The oldest oak species or the oldest specimen? Uh, the oldest individual, pardon, of that species in England. They are very obsessed with it. Um, so I can kind of infer that Tolkien is really interested in these ancient oaks as well. Um, and then we have hindthor hedges. So we have some rose species, maybe, that are often used in hedge making. Yeah. I was going to say that some species are often the cousin of like others. Um, and well, not always plants, because I was going to say like oaks and beeches uh, tend to have a lot of relationship with other uh, micro rival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can, when we think about the uh, nitrogen fixing, we can think about the mycorrhizal networks that, you know, people have used the term the world, uh, what is it, world? Wo Wood wide web, thank you. I was like, I'm starting it wrong. Wood wide web, it's the connections that fungi are enabling between tree species, both in the species or outside of the species. Um, so we can think that there's definitely decomposition in this world. So we know that there's fungi, but they're not plants. Um, mushrooms are more related to humans or animals than they are to plant life. So that's why when you, when you have a fungal infection, it's harder to get rid of than maybe a viral or bacterial infection. Um, so you can think of like ringworm or athlete's foot, those are fungal infections. They take weeks and weeks and weeks of application. Um, and usually those have greater side effects on us because they are trying, those medicines are having a hard time differentiating between human cells and fungal cells because of our DNA similarities, relatively, of course. Uh, they're not like, it's not like the mushroom in us are like 99.9% .9 similar. <laughs> then we have Linnaeus. Um, so, oh my gosh, I also think that Bilbo would totally be a taxonomist in a different world because he said he looked at the flowers in the garden, wondering what their names could be as if, as he had never seen half of them before. We definitely know we're in a different, um, maybe not ecosystem, I would argue ecosystem, but we're also within a world where the culture is different because the plants in the garden are different, which is interesting to think about. But taxonomy is the field of study of naming plant species. So we had Trifolium kentuckiense. That was because Chapel and Vincent, these two guys basically went about, they said that plant species is different from that plant species because of how it looks. And then our study was saying, yeah, you're right. The genetics of those species are very different. Well, relatively again, but Linnaeus was the person that started the field of kind of, kind of the field of modern taxonomy binomial nomenclature, which is where we have the genus name followed by the species name. So I would like to think that Bilbo, again, would be a taxonomist in a different world or maybe in a different life. If he had more time other than him and walking everywhere. Um, we also have marsh habitats. So we know that there's kind of these, again, those riparian areas with water and plants living together. We have reeds, which are in the grass family of, that we group together of the grasses, right? But it's actually the true grasses. We have straw as well, which is in the grass family. 
Uh, we have at least a quart of mead. Anybody know what makes mead? Honey? Yeah, honey. So we know there are bees also in our world, which is very nice to think about. We have pollinators. We can probably infer that with some of the other plant species that Bilbo mentions. Um, or the narrator mentions pardon, so we can infer like if these are to exist in this world, we have to have pollinators, especially bees. But here's a direct evidence of having honey. Also, we have pollen and nectar in this world now, which is said very descriptively. And we also have English ivy, uh, which is very common in England. Oh, hung with lichen. Interesting group of plant-ish things here. Lichens are actually symbiotic creatures that combine both algae, which is a plant, and fungi, which are not a plant. So they are a composite organism, basically, that live so in together that they can't live separately, um, generally. It's very complex, but he mentions lichen. I wanted to highlight them. They're not a plant, technically. Um, they're different, but they do have plant genetics or a plant genome in them. Great. Um, we also have sawn rings. Oh, tree ring studies, bingo. They were sitting on top of these tree stumps, so we can, he said sawn rings. So I was like, oh my gosh, there's clearly some seasonality in here, and we can also reconstruct some climate in Middle Earth. If the trees move or not, that's up for debate, but yeah. Uh, I was just gonna say, because hung with lichen makes me think of lichen with like the long, like scraggly, stringy kinds. I know yeah. those particularly are not very tolerant of like air pollution and stuff. Definitely not. Yeah, so lichen is a really, uh, really interesting group because some species can't tolerate air pollution while some can. So what modern researchers or lichenologists are doing is they're able to find out how much air pollution is in an area given the lichen assemblages or lichen species in that area. Um, also hung with lichen, also it shows that we have specifically the name is uh, not folios lichen, which is the flat stuff. We have crustos, which is right on rocks, folios, which is a bit leafier. Then we have fructose lichen, which is the leafy stuff that hangs down. So that's probably sugar sugared beard lichen or the old man's beard lichen, which is in the genus Usnia. Um, it's also made with teas. So it's a medicinal tea that people make. Um, if they do that or not, I'm not for sure, but we have some ethnobotany traces we could maybe follow up on, or maybe he does in the trilogy. Um, we keep moving. Uh, on it, so this is the, uh, the king of the, uh, the not fairies, but... Oh, the elves, the oh, wood like, elves. Yeah, yeah, thank you, the wood elf king. Yeah. So he says, crown of berries and red leaves, um, but during the spring woodland flowers, which I was like, oh, great, another sign of phenology. Also, I put this person up here because we have clearly in the elvish world a very intense relationality to plant life, which makes sense because they live in the middle of a freaking forest um, <laughs> and they're always out on the hunt or collecting. So it makes sense why they have a very strong relationality or cosmology with plant life. Uh, but I wanted to highlight that one. Yeah. If you don't have to rush, if you want to take some of Wednesday next week. Okay. What time does this class end? Uh, 20 after. Oh, great. Oh, I think I can. I think we're good. Okay. Ish. So it's interesting. The first half of the book, which makes sense, is dominated with a lot of talk about plants. But when we get to the, the dragon battle, there's not many plants there. Um, so in the first half of the book, we have a lot of plants mentioned. In the latter half of the book, very few plants mentioned. Um, we have, again, the rushes and the reeds. Rushes are rushes, they're rush. Um, <laughs> where the berries swell, he doesn't say it. Um, a great bridge made of wood. So this is the wooden city. So we can see that humans or these people live very closely with the forest, um, building a lot of things and constructing things from wood. Somebody said grass, good job, grass for the ponies. He doesn't say what type of grass, there's a myriad of grass species out there. That's a picture of a rush right there. Again, grass, uh, grass thatched roofs, so that's where they put straw or hay on the roofs. They're very common in England. Um, wooden end beams, that's where I would want to go to do a ginger chronology investigation is those beams. Um, we again, we have the great taxis or the yew. We can also infer um, ethnobotanically, yew has a chemical. Uh, the genus taxis is the name of the genus of the yews, but taxicol is a drug that humans have synthesized now that is um, cured some forms of breast cancer. There's a little fun tidbit for you. Uh, flowers in June, um, blossoms in spring, fruit feasting in autumn, boom, phenology right there. So this is an example of bloodroot. It's a species common to the Eastern US, not to, uh, um, to Middle Earth that we know of at least, but 
Phenology is the study of when it's peak flowering. So we can see peak flowers for bloodroot in the species are in April, but then we can also see the fruiting time, which is in latish April, early May. Um, so this is kind of the study of phenology in itself. So we know that there's some type of seasonality and phenology in Middle Earth. That was the last plant mentioned was in page 302 and 305. So we have a really clear jump when they're fighting the dragon, they're not thinking much about plants. Um, but there is gold, right? So that means that there's probably some type of gold ore. So they're melting. So they're probably burning wood to melt and uh, forge some of these goods, right? So we can see that they also use wood to burn. Um, very common. Like we can infer a lot of stuff based off of these words in relation to the plants. Um, and that's what I really want to highlight is the importance of biogeography. People might be like, okay, what's well, this important, right? Is a larger field. We can understand a lot about biotic organisms, or, organisms, pardon. We have the relationality of organisms between each other, right? Of what species are in certain areas at a given time. And we also can use that knowledge of our understanding and relationality to protect the plants. And that's what I really want to highlight is conservation of organisms that are facing uh, extinction um, in our current age of modernization, urbanization, and now climate change. Um, great. There's a little graphic showing some of the work that people are doing based off of climate change and how those implications could have on the areas. Actually, that was a good observation about gold and smelting. Also, the production of steel and mithril, which, as Leslie said, is probably in the platinum group. Wood, it does not produce sufficiently hot fires, but charcoal. Oh, it would be used to heat and uh, because platinum requires temperatures of about 800 degrees or higher. Oh, cool. and wood, you too, it's very hard to get up to that temperature. But yeah, that's actually a really good point that you need plant life to smelt iron, produce yeah. steel, yeah. and some mithril. Are better for What's that? Some woods are better. And some woods are better, yes, exactly, for charcoal. Exactly. Sweet. Okay. So I want to go over, that was a lot, right? But summary of what we discussed. So we went over the history of biogeography, the Hobbit, and the plants specifically in that book, niche partitioning, elevational gradients, right? Climate change and its effect on distributions, biodiversity, the rich biodiversity within Middle Earth, thus far within just one book, the distributions of those plants and how it changes as Bilbo travels throughout the world, that Tolkien's building, the taxonomy of the different species within, very specifically the clover genus, um, and then just overall the Middle Earth plants that he's constructing. This could be muddied up a lot when we go into the ints because those don't fit very neatly and nicely in our phylogenetic tree um, because we don't have ints, <laughs> period. Great, and that's my email if you wanted to follow up about anything we've discussed or if you have ideas. Um, we do have a few minutes, we have five. So I do have a follow-up activity. Groups of, again, same groups, I would love for you all to think about how we could design a biogeography research question and experiment relating to the floor of Middle Earth, right? So that might be testing the elevational gradient to maybe mapping the ecosystems and the bio, bio uh, yeah, the ecosystems of Middle Earth. But if you would just want to chat in your groups and maybe think of some of the ways that we could test a, a research question in our world into the Middle Earth. So just going to add one more point, and that is, this is absolutely essential in chorography in identifying and classifying, categorizing, describing different regions. The vegetation is absolutely essential. You didn't have to do that in any detail for this assignment, but even just mentioning the plants, what Nick had you do at the beginning of this, of this class is perfect. So, so think about this. Um, Feel free to, I can maybe open up a discussion board where you all could dump your questions. So I think the best way, if you're kind of like stumped of where not to go or where to go, maybe say, what if I did this to Middle Earth? What if I decreased the temperature? What if there was an ice age? Uh-oh, ice age, Middle Earth. What would happen to maybe some of the plants that we've mentioned throughout this talk? Would they live? Would they die with the fur? So if we decrease the temperature, the firs and the spruces would probably do amazing, right? Because they love those cold temperatures. But that's a way that you could maybe design a question is what if we change this about Middle Earth? Because Middle Earth is like, it's tokens, but we can change it as much as we want because it's very fictitious. So, which is a fun experiment, but if we were to maybe work with your groups for the next like three minutes where class is wrapping up, but I can open up a discussion board if that works with everyone. I would love to see what you all kind of formulate and how we can maybe test those, right? I'll respond to those on the Canvas page, yeah. Awesome, thank you.
Да, 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 да